Thanks for downloading the latest episode of the C-Suite podcast to be recorded in partnership with Future Brand. Uh, my name is Russell Goldsmith, and as Future Brand works towards the release of their latest Future Brand Index, uh, we thought we'd use this opportunity to look back at the findings of their 2020 report, where they examined the world's leading firms and determined how they fared over the previous year. Joining me online to talk through the findings of that report, it's a welcome back to the podcast to John Tipple, Future Brand's Global Chief Strategy Officer. Uh, plus, we're thrilled to have on the call Stephen Douglas, Senior Director, International Design at McDonald's. And now during the show, we'll also hear from Paul Bolt, Microsoft UK's CMO, who I caught up with at the end of 2020 to get his take on some of the highlights of the index. But John, uh, let's start with you. Hard to believe it's uh, two years, actually, since we last spoke on the uh, podcast about the Future Brand Index. And um, well, the world's uh, changed uh, just a little bit since then. Yeah, it's been a really, um, you know, obviously a, a fairly, you know, transformative couple of years. Um, not, you know, obviously the ups and downs, um, you know, we've seen some really interesting new developments, new type of work at Future Brand coming from different parts of the world. Um, we, you know, we've seen the real emergence of, you know, markets like India has really come on stream uh, in the last 12 months or so. We're also seeing a lot of companies reevaluating, uh, maybe as a response to COVID, or maybe there's just a lot of executives who've had more time on their hands than they usually do. Looking at M&As, looking at uh, new brand creation, um, and fundamentally, I think, thinking a little bit more deeply about why their company exists, what their purpose is, whether they're positioned right to go forward um, into, into, into life past 2020. So, yeah, it's been a, an interesting time. Before we go into more detail on, on the research findings for those you know that are new to the index do you want to just give us a quick overview of, of how how it's all been put together what we're really interested in ultimately is understanding the relationship between company value you know commercial value and brand and brand perception and we you know in many different ways of our work we explore that relationship what the future brand index does is it is is is, is our is it looks at the uh, the the market capitalization figures of pwc um, and we so we take the top 100 that they do every year and we reorder it based on the perceptions of 3,000, what we call informed members of the global public. And that's a balance between people, you know, they're not people you find in the streets, equally they're not the most high-end influencers either. They are uh, senior executives, mid-level executives, people who work across all sorts of industries. And, in, and, and I think most of all, the most important thing about it is it's genuinely global. Uh, we go doing 17 markets. So we're interested in their perceptions of companies they're aware of and know something about. Um, Stephen, let's bring you um, into the discussion. First of all, thank you again for, for taking the time to join us. Do you want to just quickly explain your role at, at McDonald's? Uh, sure. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me on here. Um, my background is actually in construction. Um, and you mentioned the fact that I work for McDonald's. Well, I worked for McDonald's for 20 years now. Uh, and actually started my career with them, uh, building restaurants for the company in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, these days, I'm part of the, the corporation's global development group. I'm based in an office in Paris, uh, and my responsibilities primarily relate to restaurant design in relation to all markets outside of the U.S., uh, I have a compatriot who covers the US side of the equation there. Um, and both of us together are looking at uh, the way the restaurants look um, and the way the restaurants support the experience for customers when it comes to the physical environment. So uh, as uh, already said, my background or my, my title relates to international design. Uh, that's probably a quick snapshot of the extent of it. Brilliant. And um, before we dig deeper into some of the, you know the key topic areas of the, of the report, what you know it would be great to get your opinion on on it as a whole. What what, what did you think of it? Uh, well, at, at, at the risk of offending anyone on the call, like uh, it was the first year that I'd read it in detail. Um, but what was interesting, I, I I know I'm sorry, guys. Right, but uh, <laughs> like uh, I. I Frankly, you know, what, what I found interesting about it specifically was the point in time at which you were taking the insights from the respondents, because I understand it was probably the middle of last year. 
um, or the midpoint of last year when obviously COVID was hitting hard. Um, you know, and off the back of that, you, you would say that there were probably some more obvious risers and fallers at the top end of the scale. Um, and when I speak about the risers, I'm probably speaking about those that are more in the the tech or digital field, the likes of the Apples, the NVIDIAs, you know, and even potentially falling into that category as well in some people's eyes, the likes of Netflix. On the other hand, uh, there is no doubt that you see some surprises or there's, there were some surprises for me. Um, being European, two companies with big positive moves that stood out for me were uh, L'Oreal and Shell. And, you know, in reading the report, it somewhat pushed me to try and understand the, the reasons behind that move. Excellent. Well, John, be before you come back on that, um, as, as I mentioned, I you know spoke to Paul Bolt, um, UK's uh, Microsoft's UK um, CMO. Um, so I asked him you know, the same question about what he thought of the report as a whole. So let's just have a listen to that first. Incredibly interesting. It, it is and remains a great framework and lens to through which to think about brand. Also, I think very useful for elevating brand discussion to a board level and starting to think about the brand and the meaning of brand uh, and its tangible links to to performance, you know, attracting talent, um, et cetera. There, there's a range of brands here and that I greatly admire. And these are brands that, that have cut through. And so to see a, a sort of metrics, a framework wrapped around how uh, organizations do this, I think, is, is incredibly useful for, for marketeers and, and business leaders. John, do you want to just come back on, on that? Then? I, I think whenever you do a study like we do, we, you do see some familiar um, brands that you know companies that come back year on year in every every one of these type of studies so Microsoft's the Apple's Samsung's um, I think what's really interesting and what our study is reflecting is is shifting priorities um, and, and 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 quite oftentimes you see changes beginning at the margins um, the arrival I think of you know I think the energy sector is an interesting one, as Stephen mentioned, Shell. Um, I think there's a general reassessment going on of, of the role of companies like that and, the, and the, the emergence of brands like Next Era Energy, these re renewable companies, huge, hardly ever heard of, but you begin to realize how big these companies are and the role that they're beginning to play. Um, you look at what's happening at BP with the, you know, looking again at where, where, what, what they're all about, where they wanna go, where, they, where the heart of their business will be in the future. And I think what you begin to notice across the index, um, and I, I'm quite excited to see what happens this year when we repeat, repeat it, is, th is these marginal changes, these changes that are happening at the margin seem to be reflecting shifts in consumer, customer, and, and public consciousness, public needs, the emergence of you know, new payment platforms, um, brands associated with that, the emergence of um, yeah, uh, new uh, mobility, new brands, you know, Netflix and uh, Tesla often get referenced. But also I love the fact we're still seeing some real, you know, old favourites and, you know, sitting here with McDonald's. I mean, one of the, the signs of normality is, is, is yeah, the sign of, I think this wasn't the sign of, of, of financial value, it was the Big Mac index. We've now got the sign of normality is can you go to McDonald's? And I think, I, 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 but I think there's something serious there. I, I think that, you know, what 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 the pandemic has forced us to really reconsider is what do we really value and what's what's critical to our lives and what do we no longer want to do that we did before um you know bill gates often talked about um overestimating the short term and, and under underestimating the long-term impact of things like this but i think some some brands and companies remain relatively resilient and some are genuinely under pressure um to survive if they don't make some serious shifts there's, there's a theme in the report on individuality. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I mean, Byron Sharp's been talking about this, I think, for, for some time. But I, 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 in many ways, it's the, 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 the pandemic has accentuated the, the need for substance, authenticity. Um, I think we're going to come on later and talk about the role of CEOs. The ability to make yourself to explain, the ability to be authentic, the ability to, to, to stand up for what you believe in, I think has become ever more um, uh, in demand. And, and we expect it of each other now much more. Um, and I think we expect it from the companies we want to interact with, spend time with, work for. Um, you know, and I think if you look at Tesla, has Elon Musk, but, you know, is the famous example of the probably most individualistic CEO, but what individualism really means is prioritizing distinctiveness over differentiation. 
I think the time of just looking at what your competitors are doing to try and find a point of difference against them is kind of gone. It's not enough. I think it, you have to, you know, really live by your principles. We talk a lot about um, the Future Band Index, looking at the different, you know, the relationship between purpose and experience, which is just a, 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 a marketing way of saying, practicing what you preach, do what you say. And I think that companies that go out on a limb and really stand up for what they believe in. There's a great, I don't know if you guys know about the, you know, Dan Price, the CEO of um, Gravity Payments in the States, who, you know, took a pay cut to pay his staff a, 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 a $70,000 wage. Everyone's yes. on the same wage. I think that's, a, you know, that's obviously a, um, a you know, a, some would say a, a kind of extreme example, but I think it's a sign of, you know, I talked earlier on about things that are happening in the margins coming more into the mainstream. I think that's an early bellwether of the type of individualistic behavior that will pay back in, in goodwill, pay back in the best talent wanting to work for you. And it's a smart move, in my opinion. Stephen, what are McDonald's doing to achieve individuality? Um, it's in reading down through the report, you know, I, I think that one recognizes it lists a number of themes there or qualities that have been identified as allowing organizations to stand out from those that are around about them. From memory, I think there were there were eight in total. And when you look down and through them, like uh, I think I could genuinely say that inside McDonald's, we tick the box or are trying to move the needle against probably at least six of them. You know, like I, I wouldn't go further to say like uh, more than six, you know, but what it is that I obviously believe as somebody who working inside the company, somebody working outside the company could believe the exact opposite. Um, I think for the general customer, like uh, out there, in this piece about individuality, there's one thing that people recognized in McDonald's, sometimes for good reason and sometimes for bad reason, going back over the years, which is, let's just say, our strength in process and in uh, deployment of procedures and standards. And I think that coming into the, the COVID world, in many respects, you know, what, what we have seen is a situation where health and hygiene has come very high on the agenda. And I think that there is a good chance that customers' belief in us having strong procedures and processes in place can mean that across our restaurants, when we commit to making sure we've got good hygiene processes in place, that we will probably go above and beyond those around about us in the, in the same sphere. And believe me, during 2020, um, yeah, a lot of sinews were being strained in the organization to make sure that confidence and expectation that is placed on us was not misplaced. Um, you know, we, we did seek to go above and beyond. And, you know, some of that, uh, some of that led to situations where, like, uh, actions that we undertook in the restaurants were very visible to customers and potentially serve to reinforce like uh, their trust in us. You know, so I, I, I think there is no doubt that the themes that are listed in the, in the report like have a huge degree of validity, but I think also there are some things that are just endemic to companies uh, because of their nature that makes them shine like uh, more brightly than those around about them in a COVID environment. I mean, I, I, I think that McDonald's have managed to, as an outsider, to manage to sort of turn the, the, the years of being a pariah into a positive. I think they've managed to f turn that into a confidence and they've become real iconic leaders. They do things first. The changes that, you, you know, you, you obviously know this better than me, but the, the leadership around format design and, and the restaurant design, the introduction of Wi-Fi, the changing of the color codes, the introduction of natural woods, you know, go back a few years and say that that was McDonald's, people would be surprised. And I also think that, you know, McDonald's have, have embraced technology in a way that others I think are envious of. And I think it ultimately comes down to, McDonald's is one of those rare 
beasts that is a genuinely global company. If you go to any McDonald's in any part of the world, you know, there are things that are patently different. It looks different in places. It has different things on the menu, particularly if you go to, you know, you know, I, 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 I think the last time I was in a McDonald's was probably in China. But most of the menu is different. It's localized. But I think the emotional response that people have to McDonald's around the world is the same. You know, and I, and I think that that's what a truly global brand is. It's it's not just present, it's culturally embedded in a way that we all, a kid in China and a kid in, you know, Chelmsford, all feel the same about McDonald's. They have that same emotional response, that same anticipation, that same specialness. And I think that that is partly what individualism, being an individual type of company, you know, yields you. That's the return of, of taking a stand, being clear about what you're all about but excuse me about having the wherewithal to, to adapt uh, to what's going on locally and contextually and, and I think that's really powerful and, and pretty hard to mimic actually. I think uh, to build a little on what it is you say there my job does relate to restaurant design and you called out a, a number of topics there that feed into that sphere and mm. um, yes we're a big organization yes we're represented across so many countries globally. Um, what I recognize as being one of my responsibilities is to try and take the experience for customers who are coming to McDonald's uh, to a level where they're getting something that they would not expect us to deliver. You know, when we, when we sought to move away from like uh, plastic seats and move into upholstery, like uh, to provide an environment that was not cold and sterile, but was warm and inviting. You know, there's a number of things that we've done over the years, which I think have like stood us in good stead um, and like uh, helped improve the perception of the company overall. But uh, that's only one part of the equation. You know, I, I think that there's a number of different threads to this. And when you are sort of like focused on the same end game altogether, all of those threads need to come together for you to have the maximum impact you can. There's no one thing in a company that I can point to that makes McDonald's significantly different from any, from any other company. But I think that there's a combination of things in the company that can help set us apart. Some are more recognizable than others, and that's where coming back to the themes that it is that you mentioned, I can't point to any one of the themes individually and say that's exactly McDonald's. But I think that because we're effectively trying to move the needle, you know, on a significant portion of them, what it is we're doing across all those threads, like uh, does have like uh, an effect that is more valuable than any one of them individually. Interesting stuff. Well, listen, here's, here's Paul Bolt again on what Microsoft UK are doing to achieve individuality. Customers want to understand what we stand for uh, in very simple terms. And sometimes brands forget how important this is. For example, when I meet with customers, most of the time we'll speak about our purpose versus our products, because in the world of, of tech, technical specifications, product feature function comparison side by side don't really create clear enough differentiation between technology brands but what you stand for does you know, do we have amazing technology yes of course we do but when i go and spend time with customers we speak more about the purpose of microsoft versus our products and as marketeers we have a really important opportunity i think more so than ever to define the individuality um, amongst your customers and I think through clear storytelling, storytelling that underscores the purpose of the brand, the values of the brand, that's where the roots of our individuality or any other organization's individuality would stem from. And so when I reflected back over the year to date, it's really interesting how you know, topics such as sustainability, uh, social injustice are no longer optional. These are, these are front and, and center. Uh, and there are some good examples of how of how Microsoft have have addressed these topics, have utilised the opportunity to talk about what we stand for to to drive home that individuality. And there's some good examples such as our, our public commitment to go carbon negative by 2030, but not just to make the announcement, but show real transparency, 
and detail um, as to how we're going to achieve this. You know, likewise, made a recent announcement around skilling one and a half million people in the UK for careers in tech. And really, that's around helping the UK remain competitive and helping build the skills we need uh, for the future. But all of these types of activities, all of these conversations, they say a lot about Microsoft. They say a lot about us as an organization. And of course, it would be very easy to say, well, you're Microsoft. You have the reach and the scale to do this. But there are initiatives happening throughout the business that aren't necessarily driven by budget, but they're driven by individuals, by people. These initiatives are aligned to our mission. And I think what it tells me is that if your people feel empowered to connect to the mission, to leverage the mission in the work they do every day, and if your brand is is ultimately the sum of all, all the interactions you have with the world, then you're connecting the work you do to broader objectives are vital. But as I say, I think there's a phenomenal opportunity amongst marketeers to reinforce what a company stands for and drive that individualization in, in the way we tell stories, in the way we link our work back to our brand purpose. Okay, I'm keen to focus on a couple of the uh, the sectors that you've um, analysed. Before we do that, though, and we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but John, who were the big movers overall since the uh, the previous report was published? I mean, I, in, in reflection of the new priorities point I talked about and new parts of the world coming to coming to play, I, I think the, probably one of the most surprising things was the arrival of Reliance Industries um, at number two in the study. Um, uh, you know, we mentioned Netflix, and I think Netflix is fairly well covered. Um, and has been touched on in other, in, in other conversations. But Reliance is one of those, you know, fundamental to life in India at this, at this moment in time, organisations that is, is hugely successful, purposeful, uh, and has, has, is, 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 is beginning to be recognised for that. And it's beginning to punch above and outside of its, of its home market in India and, and get the, the note and get the credit, credit it, it deserves. I think that's a really interesting business. PayPal, I think, is... In some ways, I think PayPal, you know, sometimes when you're, you're, you're the you're cornerstone of a category, you kind of almost drift into the background. But I think the, the emergence of PayPal um, as, uh, you know, a, a really vibrant and meaningful brand, obviously partly by the way our lives have been turned around by, by, by the pandemic. I'd also flag companies like Walmart have been really interesting in the way they've risen. Um, I think they got a lot of goodwill and credit for the way that, and this is another angle on the individual aspect. I mean, they did a lot for their staff. Um, they stood up for their staff and got the credit for it, I think, in the eyes of certainly US consumers. And Stephen mentioned L'Oreal earlier. I mean, L'Oreal, you know, had a slight dip previously, but have really turned things around, really celebrated, brought an authenticity to their communications, did some really interesting stuff with Eva Longoria, which got picked up in social media. Um, very powerfully and took, t- took advantage of that situation in a very constructive way that I think played very powerfully to their their, their self-esteem positioning and, and helping people find that. And I think there's never more relevant time for companies like that. And I think if I was to broaden that out into a broader theme, I think there's a general reassessment going on of, of what a company's for. I think if you think that pan- the pandemic and 2020 as a whole caused a whole load of you know, escalated fears and worries. We, 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 you know, politics was part of the conversation, social unrest. It wasn't just about a pandemic 2020. So all of us were forced to make some fundamental reassessments. And companies that have, have stood and, you know, taken a positive approach to that situation as opposed to hide away, I think are getting exponentially credited for it. I mentioned a few of them there. They're also, you know, they're also watch outs. I mean, uh, you know, our biggest faller this year was Gilead, the uh, pharmaceutical business, obviously hugely successful generally, but if there's any slight hint of, you know, there's a sort of um, fragility to reputation right now. You can easily be castigated. You can easily be overpromoted. So I think it's about, you know, finding, not, not getting too excited by the, the ups and not getting too down by the downs. But, I, you know, what the Gilead performance suggests is that, you know, people can very quickly change opinions if, they're, if you're seen to be doing something that isn't in line with, with standing up for what people need these days. I'm sure they'll be back. Stephen, your thoughts on that? I liked John's use of the word fragility uh, because I think that the way communications are these days and the visibility of big corporations, either a well-placed step or a misplaced step can have big effects on way companies are are perceived, certainly in the short term. And I think that was what uh, stood out for me as far as L'Oreal was concerned, specifically. Like, uh, having had a bit of a dip, they were back. And I think, you know, this piece about authenticity is a huge 
part of the equation. Um, authenticity for me is part and parcel of an ability to be trusted. Um, mm -hmm. And if you lose that authenticity um, and that connection with who it is that you're trying to communicate with, then the, the trust runs out the door uh, behind it. Uh, so trust is fragile. And uh, off the back of that, I think that everyone needs to, to be aware that's a cornerstone. There was um, one section of the index that stood out for me when I was reading through it. Um, and that's that, you know, your, your research partner, John QRI, they noted five mm -hmm. key drivers for resilience. And so they've got it listed as uh, authenticity, premium, thought leadership, mission and innovation. And using those mm. parameters, it, it concluded that uh, Netflix, Apple, uh, Nextera, um, Energy, uh, Next Era Energy, PayPal, and Microsoft scored the highest here. I'm going to come back to you on, on it, but first of all, I, this is you know I asked Paul uh, Bolt exactly what he thought about uh, that particular finding. Well, firstly, I, I sometimes have an allergic reaction when I hear the word resilience. There's all kinds of connotations around you know toughing it out uh, wrapped around it. So to see that broken down into you know, really actionable categories that collectively build resilience rather than resilience being you know, this concept of, of, of toughness and toughing it out. Clearly, I'm, I'm pretty happy that we've positively progressed across the key drivers that you've, you've mentioned, which is great to read because obviously, you know, the respondents to the survey are feeling and seeing, you know, the work Microsoft are, are doing across the categories of, you know, authenticity, thought leadership, uh, innovation, uh, etc. So incredibly happy to see us there. But by no means does this mean our, our work is, is done. We're a 45-year-old business, and so we've learned a thing or two about resiliency. Um, most importantly, we're able to reflect on, on the lessons we've learned during those 45 years to make us better. And we talk a lot in Microsoft at the moment around us being a learn-it-all culture and not a know-it-all culture. And I, I think that's a, a really nice, succinct way of, of, of summing up how we, how we think as an organization. There's a great you know, of course, it'd be remiss of me to not quote Bill Gates during this conversation, but one of the great Bill Gates quotes around success is a lousy teacher because it seduces smart people into thinking that they can't lose. I think really resonates when you think about uh, resilience. And, you know, we've been on our own transformation journey, and hopefully there are some listeners to the, to the podcast who follow us and have been following that transformation. It, it's well documented. But the, the transformation, the cultural transformation of Microsoft over the last few years have been really closely aligned to the, the drivers of authenticity, thought leadership, mission and innovation, and, and of course, the quality um, of, of our products. My, my initial reaction is that I see these key drivers on a daily basis, living and breathing in Microsoft, which, of course, you, you can't just stand up and say, we are all these things, because ultimately, people will judge us on, on our actions, you know, not necessarily what we have written on our office wall in terms of our mission or our vision or our values or, or, or whatever it may be. I think when I look at resilience, particularly, you know, in the face of 2020 so far, uh, personally, I couldn't be prouder of the way we've responded as an organization to COVID uh, in the way that we've supported our employees, um, our customers, of course, um, you know, working alongside deploying and building products with customers, with government, um, assisting schools and educators, you know, to, to flip to remote learning, but ultimately helping all of these organizations build out, in the first instance, resilient operations um, in the initial response to COVID. Um, and obviously this gives us the chance to share our learnings with our customers. Uh, and, I, and I think the response has really been a testament to the culture we have built and ultimately, there's a mission at the heart of Microsoft that we we truly believe in. So, John, um, thoughts on what, what Paul had to say there? Well, I, I kind of agree with him about resilience. I, I think resilience has some overtones and connotations that are slightly aggressive, slightly um, macho and, and out of step with what businesses need to be all about. I think um, when I think about resilience, I'm more inclined to think about companies that are making sure they're future proof making sure that they are um, doing the things that people value and respect, doing it in a consistent way to drive trust, as Stephen mentioned earlier, and doing it in service of their purpose. So I think the companies you mentioned, PayPal, Microsoft, you know, Netflix, Apple, these are companies that aren't afraid to put 
their money where their mouth is. They attend, you know, really hard on, on looking across the entire experience piece um, to make sure that what they say in one channel is, is, is consistent and, and reflects what's going on in other parts of their business so that the, the, the company feels um, connected, so that the company feels um, that it's working, going in the same direction. The brand there that isn't in that list, but I would add is Nike. I think Nike have done a fun, and, and Nike and Apple are both interesting because they're design-led organizations. And as we've got a designer on the call, I thought I'd bring design in. But I think they're design-led businesses, but they use design to shape behavior. And if, if brand is anything, it's a behavior shaping force. And, and they're highly consistent in the way they do that. So whether it's resilience or whether that's just simply making yourself future-proof, which is kind of, you know, in line with what Paul said, is it, for me a, a kind of better definition of resilience. I think that's what matters. It's, it's, it's are you doing what you say and are you doing it in a way that feels connected to what people want or what a sufficient co constituency of the public want? Um, so yeah, it's exciting, um, but it's also, you know, there's, like I said before, there's an inevitable risk if you say one thing and you're not consistent in the delivery of that. Well, let's, um, let's drill down into some of the sectors then uh, in the report. So let's start with consumer goods and services. So the report states, and I've got it here, uh, that consumer goods <laughs> and services have reacted quickly and um, effectively to new consumer needs and priorities. And then it's got listed among the top uh, 10 climbers year on year were Roche, uh, L'Oreal and Walmart. L'Oreal, obviously, we've mentioned uh, with McDonald's. Uh, Stephen, you'll be pleased to know, listed as also surging ahead um, along with Netflix. And then it goes on to say that the perception is that these firms care about their clients and their staff and are able to give them what they want um, with the Future Brand Research reporting that when it comes to an emotional connection with the brands, the consumer goods sector scores the highest. 29% of respondents said they felt passionate about these companies. Um, Stephen, your thoughts on, on those findings? Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Like uh, we I, thought, I, I, I we love thought it. you might think that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Mic drop. Right, I'll move on. <laughs> um, you know, as far as the thinking is concerned, I, I'm going to answer the question to some extent through the McDonald's lens. Like, um, we need to recognise that we were probably the first place that many customers were probably able to go to get something to eat when restrictions lifted last year. Okay, why was that? Because of the fact that we have uh, a pedigree that's been proven year over year over year in relation to drive through And when you've got that as a pedigree to start off with, and then when it's overlaid with the, the introductions that we've made of delivery services, is really put us in a good place to be able to serve customer needs. And so from the point of view of accessibility of the company, visibility of the company, okay, we were so well placed to be able to take advantage of that because of the fact that we, we were very, very easily able to apply contactless procedures like in our operations um, that completely appealed to customers who are like uh, coming to visit us. And then I, I think that off the back of that, you know, obviously in the first instances, we were opening drive through lanes and then offering delivery services. And then after that, we were opening dining areas. And when we were opening dining areas, we were doing so with very visible social distancing measures in place, uh, designating flows through the restaurants, arranging seating in such a way that we were like uh, increasing spaces. And I think each of those things just give confidence, again, to the point that I was making earlier, that we are trying to do our best to absolutely do the right thing. And the confidence that you can have when you come to visit us, you know, shouldn't be misplaced. But uh, th there's also, I think, the piece about being in tune with the customers. Um, and that saw us as an organization doing things that, a year ago, we wouldn't have thought about doing it all. You know, just one example. Um, in Australia, uh, at a certain point, we were selling bread and milk from our restaurants in order to serve customers' needs uh, on the ground in the communities that we're serving. You know, and I think this piece about being in a position to step into customers' lives when they need it in ways that supports them is like uh, has been a huge benefit to us. And it's something that we need to take forward and capitalize upon. 
Yeah, just picking up on what you were saying about being the first or one of the first to to kind of open, you know, for people to go and get food again. Could, I don't know how how much was the responsibility of your PR team proactively sending the, uh, the the pictures into the news desks, but could you believe, I mean, the pictures that we saw on the news of the, those mile long queues going into the drive throughs of, of McDonald's, could, could you believe what you were seeing at that point? Uh, <laughs> uh, could we believe it? Um, you know, on the one hand, you've got to say no. You know? On the other hand, I, I can tell you there were probably a few people in the company who had a tear in their eye as I saw that happening. Right. You know, because the fact it, on some levels, you know, and I don't want it to sound misplaced or arrogant or whatever, you know, there are people out there who truly love this brand. Mm. And in many levels, that was an expression of it. And when you're able to have the, the privilege you know, to be able to serve people who've been waiting for over an hour sometimes in their car waiting to get served. Honestly, uh, you, it's, 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 that's an amazing feeling. That is an amazing I love the guy, who, um, the guy who didn't have a car, who made a car out of a cardboard box so that he could qualify for drive through <laughs> <laughs> and was standing in it. <laughs> that was the best uh, one for me. I, I, I think on the other piece, like um, we shouldn't admit when we're talking about customers, coming back to our restaurants to ignore how big a piece of the equation the staff in the restaurants are themselves. Um, those people, like quite frankly, the, the efforts that they've put in, the way they've responded to the situation, it's been amazing. And I, and I think off the back of this, I think speaking for me personally, and I'm sure, you know, for a number of other people as well, uh, this whole exercise, this whole episode is going to have a lasting effect on how everybody looks at staff who are working behind the counter, at a cash desk or whatever. Like um, anyone who takes them for granted like uh, is in the wrong place. Sure. Um, John, thoughts on this sector? I think consumer is frontline everyday life stuff. And one of the, the big things that's changing, particularly around purpose, is companies that are making themselves fundamental to life and, and in particular how life is going to be in the future. And I say whether, whether you're L'Oreal, Walmart, McDonald's, Home Depot, uh, Netflix, these are brands that aren't just giving customers what they want. These are brands that are perceived to be building the systems and infrastructures and platforms on which life as we know it and life as we want it to be you know, it's still going to be there. It's, it's going to keep growing into the future. I think it's interesting right now that in terms of brand perception, Netflix is, is higher perceived than the Walt Disney company, um, which in many ways doesn't make any sense at all. But I think that if you asked, you know, underpinning that, I think is a belief at which of these companies is shaping the future versus, you know, part of the past. I think there's a really interesting question there. When you look at, um, I, I know we've talked about Tesla, you know, by far and away the most highest placed um, automotive brands. I think Toyota are also, you know, relatively well placed too. Both really different companies, but both perceived, I think, to be shaping the future of mobility. And I think that's the game in every sector, not just uh, not just consumer, but I think consumer is the most present for us right now. Um, and that's the thing that is most in our face. So I think whether you're a consumer packaged goods, consumer service or anything else, it's, it's asking yourself that question as a leader, you know, to what extent is what we do fundamental to life in the future is it a platform on which people can enjoy life or live a more healthy life or a successful life it doesn't always have to be um you know wholly positive and you know you know hair shirted it could just be gives you pleasure when you want something to eat really fast and it's beautiful you know it's nice to eat mcdonald's you know mm -hmm. when you want to watch something that just right for you netflix you know it, it's 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 that ability to to create that sense of belief that you're building that platform i think the new the new expression of purpose moving forward but netflix are one of those brands that have just had an incredible lockdown i mean it's just ridiculous really when you think about it like pe 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 people think, <laughs> no absolutely but no yeah. but what i mean is yeah, it's become right. one of those terms one of those brands that's become a t you know like people tweeting i've, I've I've completed Netflix kind of thing, you know, you know, during lockdown mm. and things like that. It's just. I, I think, I think you can, I think there's some obvious cliches about, you know, people being at home and, you know, bored and blah, blah, blah. But I think that the groundwork of Netflix was done before the COVID. I mean, they, they, they've spent yeah, on innovation. 
there's a lot behind that 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 simple screen that serves you you know it's highly personalized a lot of the buzzwords marketing talks about innovation personalization um, experience uh, engagement it just is all brought to life on that one little screen but the but or in, often came massive screens in people's houses these days but the um the the back end is is where they're getting the reward for the for the hard work and the investment in that the, the trick for them is to, to keep it going Walt Disney won't sit on their hands we've seen Disney plus really surging they're going to respond and I think that what well, that's what's kind of exciting to be in the industry right now is is the the, the fragility we talked about but the ability to keep coming back the ability to innovate the ability to make smart partnerships make smart alliances, create, do things in a distinctive way that people haven't seen before. That's what people are yearning for and people but, are interested in. Is, I mean, again, I don't know if we're sort of digressing a little bit here, but it is, I guess, relevant. But something like Disney Plus, and this is just my opinion of it, is, is you look at their yeah. their menu and you're like, well, I've seen all of that. Whereas Netflix has just got, there's just no end to new shows that you haven't. Oh, I think it's the tip of the iceberg on Disney. If you think about the franchises they own, the ability to connect real world and, and, and you know, real world experiences, uh, what's happening on the screen, the merchandising capabilities, the the, the, the power of their brands in their franchises. I think they've only just started to really yeah. bring those to bring those to bear. It's about much more than the movies that they're putting on the screen. I did enjoy the Mandalorian. Sorry though, to so. give you that. Sorry to give you a slap down there, but I, <laughs> no, no, no. Disney Plus. Oh, like, no, as I said, I was, I was a big fan of the Mandalorian. So there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen, go on. No, I mean, what I was going to say was, you know, to some extent, build to build on the conversation you were having there. Like, um, I mentioned Netflix at the beginning, yeah. you know, and I think that obviously within your report, you've tried to give, let's just say, industry place categorization to each of the, the top 100. And, you know, at the beginning, I, I was putting Netflix somewhere under the umbrella of digital. You know, because mm. let's just say that's the way that I intuitively see it. I, I see it through a digital device. And I think that because of the fact that Netflix has come at things from that angle, it has given them mm. very much the, the impression of being first big mover into that territory of streaming. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, and I think that this is where these days a, there's an awful lot of blurring as far as categorization is concerned. A, because of the influence of digital, you know, like, uh, is Uber a digital platform or is it a taxi company? Like, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure how the general public would sort of like place that categorization. But what, what I think one sees is that when people capitalize upon a niche in the digital sphere, based upon whatever product, they have an immediate advantage. So that, that, that's where I see a bit of a blurring of some of the lines, but also advantage to be true. had. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's, I mean, there's a technical answer to, the, to your point, which is we use the definitions that PwC set. And there's a reason yeah. for that, because the number of times people have, uh, have personally got in touch with me to say, why the hell is my company associated as a consumer goods brand? It, 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 but, but your point, the, the serious point or the broader point is a good one. I think where innovation is going, it's beginning to, and, and particularly digital innovation, it's beginning to ask the questions about what type of company you are. I mean, I mentioned Nike earlier. Is Nike an apparel company, a sportswear company, a tech company, a personal performance brand? I mean, the, the, the ability to transcend your spaces and your categories, there's a lot of you know food and beverage companies, but of course we make food and beverage and we still fill factories and we still you know, operate in supermarkets, but, you know, they're beginning to turn up on Amazon on e-commerce websites. They're beginning to go beyond food and beverage per se. There's some really interesting stuff. If you look at what, um, for example, Mars have been doing in the, in the pet care space, which is just looking at the whole value chain, not just making pet food, trying to understand all those moments in the journey that, uh, that, a, that a pet owner will go down and how can we uh, be part of that conversation. And I guess the technology companies were the inspiration for this, you know, Amazon, Facebook, Google, you know, the acquisitions of Instagram, WhatsApp, you know, all well-known stuff, but it was really looking at people's entire digital ecosystem or to put it into simple terms, what people do on their phones and figuring out how they can play a part and, and, and be more relevant. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's actually, you're actually right to point out it was start, it's been triggered by digital. 
but actually what it's doing is, is trying to figure out different ways to be relevant and meaningful to people's lives. Okay, okay. Lo- lo- lots to get through. Let's move on to technology. Um, so this is an interesting one because in the... That's 20- Russell saying, theme. stop digressing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. But um, no, on, on the... On the, uh, on the tech- well, I was, do you know what I was thinking, actually? I also watched um, Hamilton on, on Disney+. Plus. So there you go. I was probably... Being- <laughs> I was probably being a, a bit harsh, but um, that's still. Um, that, I, I've, I've been told by my kids that's the one musical that will be acceptable to you, Dad. I'm still yet to be convinced. Oh, it's, yeah. ex- it's excellent, and we've got tickets. I'm looking yeah, forward to, to actually watching it in the real world. Right, some technology. Yeah. So, so I was about to say that um, on, on this one, um, in the 2018 index, almost every technology company had fallen in the ratings, yeah. um, and that despite the fact that nearly half of them uh, were viewed as so-called companies of the future. But so the, the 2020 index has more more technology companies in the global 10 uh, top 10 than any other sector so obviously you've got apple at number one um the report again it goes on to say that although tech brands are deemed to be innovative and in many cases indispensable in modern day life uh, they have lost their emotional connections with their customers trust is also an issue um, and in a world of fake news concerns over privacy and increasing public desire for corporate accountability uh, seemingly unbreakable brands are beginning to show the crack so once again here's uh, what Paul Bolt had to say about that? It's a big question. Um, <laughs> it might be a big answer. L- let me let me pick through this. You know, most recently at, at one of our um, uh, events, um, Satya Nadella said, um, I'm paraphrasing now, we've seen nearly two years worth of digital transformation in just two months. I think organisations at the moment are working at unprecedented speed uh, and in unprecedented times. And we are beginning to see, as, as, as you've suggested, just how critical digital technology is in the way we respond to the COVID crisis, whether that's the initial emergency response kind of through to some form of recovery and then and then on to you know reimagining um, the world going forward. And you know there's lots of great models online that walk through the kind of various phases. Um, but but broadly, I view them as, you know, responding, recovering, and, and reimagining. And and during this period, we became digital first responders, a phrase I never thought I'd use a year ago. But rolling out tools and platforms to enable the most critical of work to take place, and also prioritising mission critical infrastructure, and that's at a country, at a country level. And a good example of that is around, you know, this, in a matter of days, deploying. Uh, Microsoft Teams to 1.2 million NHS users to allow our medical community to be productive, to collaborate and to share information uh, in an effective and secure way to to do their best work. Also worked on an incredibly interesting project, the UK Ventilator Challenge, again, bringing together some of the most innovative manufacturers in the UK to design and build and roll out ventilators in, in record time. So from kind of raw back-end compute power, you know, right the way through to the use of augmented reality uh, using products like HoloLens, which is a mixed reality headset to get folks in the room virtually to to bring the ventilator challenge uh, to life. And so the criticality of digital tools, the indispensable, I believe, was the, the phrase you used. It's never been clearer to the extent that these tools are indispensable um, in fact, I think in our, uh, our last set of published figures, our last earnings call, we've reported 5.2 billion minutes of Teams usage in a single day, which is just remarkable and shows digital collaboration at a kind of global scale. But powerful technologies and in, in cloud computing, you know, artificial intelligence um, are hugely powerful technologies. We, you know, we're the first generation to use machines to make decisions on our behalf. It's fundamentally transforming the way we live and work and potentially holds the key to some of the world's most pressing issues and challenges. And I would go as far as to say, you know, the cloud and digital have created new economies and brought with them uh, a promise of new jobs and, and new ways of working. But with this comes challenges. And I think this is where that issue of trust and that you refer to really, really sits. There are concerns about the impact on people's jobs, the vulnerability to cyber attacks, your online I- identity, uh, and also whether technology is leaving some people behind. 
But I think the very crux of the question uh, and, and the very crux of answering this is I think people, most importantly now, are asking if they can trust the technology they use and the media they consume. And they're asking if they can trust the technology companies you know, who are designing, developing, and deploying these new technologies. They, they, they're asking if they can trust them. And I think the fundamental question is, do these companies really understand their responsibilities? I'd, I'd say at Microsoft, we are, of course, hugely optimistic, hugely optimistic about the benefits of technology, but also we're not, uh, we're also clear-eyed about, about the challenges, these challenges, these concerns, they're real. And we're committed to earning and sustaining trust from our customers and our partners and, and the communities we serve. And what I would say is this is this is nothing new. I mean, 15 years, I think it was 15 years ago, maybe slightly longer, uh, we launched our Trustworthy Computing Initiative. But the technology is rapidly evolving, is impacting all of us, is infused through our daily professional and, and personal lives. And we know there's more work we need to do to continue earning that trust and um, you know we'll be judged by by our actions and and not just our words uh, you know I, I've, I've talked about grounding the work your people do and what you stand for really in the in in the mission of the organization and you know our mission is to empower everyone on the planet to achieve more every individual and every organization on the planet to achieve more and we do believe we have a fundamental responsibility to help others succeed because our success is built on the success of our customers. That is our business model. That is how we monetize our intellectual property by our customers being successful, choosing to use our platforms and our tools and consuming those at scale due to their success. And I think when you look at trust in an era of digital, sometimes it's the fundamental business model that shapes the way organizations behave and shapes the decisions they make. And for our business model uh, to be one of, you know, success predicated by the success of our customers really allows us to create a common goal for us all. The emotional connection, as simple as it sounds, telling the world we care is, is something that we've learned a lot about in, in, in 2020. As I've said, customers want to understand what we stand for. I mentioned earlier on, I kind of speak more about purpose than than product. But alongside some of the initiatives and the work we're doing, you know, I do believe there is a, a responsibility for Microsoft to help build a, a fairer and more equitable society and, and economy. And we we accept and we, um, we we take that challenge, and, you know, in all seriousness with the work we do um, every day. I think my final point, you know, would be is that, you know, there's a lot of cool tech um, out there. You know, you could have the CMO on from a number of tech companies and they'll all tell you, you know, how great their tech is. But what we're finding is the tech that people choose goes far beyond just the cool tech, the features, the functions, the speeds, the feeds. And actually, you know, the decision making process we're seeing in businesses is starting to encompass, you know, mission, integrity, um, trust. And frankly, looking to work with uh, with uh, someone who has a vested interest in your success. So apologies for the monologue. It's a it's a meaty question that probably deserved a meaty answer. And I hope I've covered uh, all the points uh, in, in, in the question you posed. So uh, sticking with the technology sector, the report cites Facebook as an example of a brand suffering from the trust issue, dropping to number 37 in the Future Brand Index, uh, having been 11th in 2014. Uh, Similarly, Alphabet, Google's parent company, had slipped to number 40 compared to number 21 in 2016. Uh, John, thoughts on the technology sector? I think technology is a coming-of-age story. I think Paul, Paul talked about uh, Microsoft being, I think, a 40-year-old company or nearly a 40-year-old company. A lot of the, the Facebooks and the Googles are, are just coming out of their teens. And anyone that's got, you know, kids who are coming out of their teens into their 20s, they are exciting, unexpected, volatile, you know, uh, entities. And they often do things that you don't expect. They make mistakes. But at the end of the day, they, you know, they will, you know, they find their way. And I think that what's happening with a lot of those companies is, They've had this meteoric rise. Um, They've empowered our lives in so many different ways. But inevitably, along the way, there are new questions, some ethical, 
some almost philosophical questions about the way that they are changing our lives. And um, I think those things are going to have to be worked through. I think that, and they are working through it. I think right now it's um, in many cases through the lens of, you know, social media rage and aggressive congressional committees or what have you. But I, I think these companies are, um, you know, pushing boundaries and moving humanity in, in the whole, on the whole forward. Um, and when you do that, there are, you know, there are bumps in the road. So I, I think to some extent, um, the, 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 when I look for inspiration, you do look at Microsoft, you do look at Apple, companies with a few, few more miles on the clock. I think some of the proactivity that Tim Cook's taken around privacy and data um, uh, and the commitments around that are a sign of things to come. I think that's going to have to happen for all companies or else, you know, they will fail. And one of the things that doesn't matter how um, dominant you are, I think one of the things that's that's both exciting and, and um, fruit fragile about technology is people can change who they use at the click of a mouse. It's, it's not difficult to, to click on a mouse. You don't have to get up and move and cross the road even. You just can do it on your screen. So I think making sure, and as I talked at the beginning, this, this attending to the relationship, you know, whether it's supportive or detrimental between how you're perceived as a brand and your performance is really important. If you're an organization that's super wealthy, but is not very well regarded, then that ultimately will, will become an issue when someone better or someone different comes along. Healthcare is another sector that's that's fared well in the index. Thoughts on that one, John? Well, healthcare in the index was certainly taking the mantle of technology and te- the, 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 the blurring of, you know, a little bit what Stephen was saying, that the, the blurring between technology, digital and, and healthcare is, is really apparent. I mean, are health companies tech companies? Um, in many cases, they are. If you look at the devices, business brands like Medtronic, which is very highly regarded in our index, and similarly, the way that companies like GSK, um, companies like Roche, you mentioned, are embracing genetic technology, uh, immunology, immunity technology to really create pipelines, rich pipelines of, of, of vaccines and medicines that will be, um, you know, genuinely looking after and protecting people's lives. So people don't become patients. And when they do become patients, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are cured. So I, th- I think healthcare is vibrant. Healthcare is also um, heavily uh it's complicated at the moment it's, it, from an investor perspective i think healthcare companies are overly diversified they're quite complicated and i think we're seeing a degree of simplification in their portfolios which i think makes a lot of sense um whether that be splitting consume their consumer divisions away from their pharmaceutical divisions or whether it's splitting within their pharmaceutical divisions into um into into discrete offerings around particular vaccines or medicines there are a lot of dynamism going on within the healthcare space. And the other, the other things that are happening at the more consumer end is the moves by brands like Walmart and Amazon themselves into providing an, you know, access to healthcare where people are. And I think the revolution that they're bringing around, around healthcare in, 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 in that part of the market is also incredibly exciting. Um, and people can, you know, you know, the healthcare provision and also the drugs and services, the drugs and vaccines that are provided at, 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 the, at the more mass end are all interesting signs of where healthcare is going. And it's definitely going to be the new rock star category um, in, well, terms of, in terms of how they're behaving. Given the research for this report that we're discussing now, obviously was done at the initial phases of lockdown. Do you think, I mean, you know, mm. we mentioned that you've got the new index coming out, you know, this year. Do you think those kind of brands that maybe certain, you know, some consumers, you know, the AstraZeneca's, the Pfizer's, these are brands that are now, we're seeing every day in the news that we hadn't, you know, so, yeah. you know, your, your general public may not be as aware of like a, a McDonald's. So do you see, what are you expecting from the next index with, with brands like that in the healthcare sector? Or, you know, considering think, everything that's gone on over the last 12 months? I think if this, I think this next wave may be too soon, but the wave after that, I think what we might see is these organizations have felt good about coming out from behind their logos. Because of the regulatory pressure, because of the history of, of pharma, um, because of the way pharma is often portrayed in the media or movies, you know, Netflix movies and what have you, there's a, there's a fear sometimes in these organizations about becoming too public. I, I don't necessarily, I would imagine that being on the news, as you put it, all the time isn't a naturally comfortable place for a lot of these organizations, not least as they don't necessarily always have 
um, you know, highly developed marketing functions. Quite often it's a corporate comms team that's looking after global reputation and, and, and marketing. But I think inevitably the trigger of COVID will encourage these companies that will force them in some ways to come out from behind their logos, to take leadership, um, to, to, to be proactive around regulation and to be proactive about finding their voice. Um, and in so doing, I think they'll be to the benefit of everyone. Um, I think there'll be greater transparency in what they're doing and why they're doing it and who they're doing it for. And there'll be goodwill to be had both from a public and but 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 also investors and analysts and and and, and a constituency that often gets forgotten. But we Paul talked about it earlier, the people who work for these companies, you know, the ability to attract talent, the best talents um, is going to be a real battleground that they have to win. There's only X number, a limited number of, of great scientists every year that you, you know these companies are all battling for. So the more they can bring their out inside outside in a way that they feel good about is essential. And I think it's going to come down to leadership of these organizations and the ability for these leaders to communicate and explain, which I think still remains a challenge, and to do it with confidence and also for their brand to be something that they they live and behave you know, a lot in line with, all, you know, all the time, not just when they're, when they want to publicly communicate. You were nodding along to a few things there. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. I, I think that there's a couple of points, like John was mentioning the likes of Facebook and Google. And, you know, I'm speaking as somebody who's involved in design at McDonald's, not somebody who's like uh, following every industry every day and understanding all the ups and downs you know, the way that others are. But, you know, with Facebook and Google, you know what what I think that you recognize is at the beginning they were they were offering something that nobody else was offering. You know, like uh, with Google, it was pure convenience to be able to find what it was that you were looking for on the web. Like uh, with Facebook, it was like uh, connections amongst people in order to allow everyone to stay up to date with what what one another was doing. And I think that you know one of the challenges when you're recognized as delivering something, is to move it on from there to deliver something more than that. How do you do what it is you're already doing? Well, better than you've done it in the past. With the result that those guys like uh, set the bar at such a level that they've actually made it difficult for themselves to be seen as progressing. So perhaps, you know, particularly in the year just gone past, they perhaps suffered more just as a result of the fact that other people were seen to be taking things forward more than they were because perhaps they've now found themselves in a situation where, let's just say, they've ticked so many boxes for people, they're struggling to find new boxes to tick. I just want to pick up on the second point that John made, which was about uh, pharmaceutical organisations coming out from behind their logos. I, I think it would be fair to say that most big organisations do have a reluctance about sticking their heads too far above the, the parapet. Um, you know, because I think most people recognize that because you're a large organization, you have responsibilities, but you also need to be humble enough that as a large organization, you know that there's going to be opportunities there to address. And I think that, you know, one of the big challenges these days is for people to find themselves in a situation to put their head above the parapet. Um, and again, it comes back to this piece about authenticity, to put their head above the parapet and to be able to say, here's what it is that we've done. Here's where we recognize our shortcomings are. And here's what it is that we're going to do about it and be able to deliver against what it is that you're doing about that. And I think that for a CEO to do that, yes, it involves coming out from behind the logos and it requires a degree of strength. And the, the word used earlier was resilience. Uh, because you know that not every time you're going to get it 100% right. The CEOs these days are like, uh, on many levels, more is being asked of them than ever before. John, it's it's not been a good year for financial services, uh, according to the report. What, why is that? I think financial services have been probably the most affected by digitization and the shift to, by which I mean the automation of their industry. And, um, you know, and I think that the startup community has really targeted financial services as a uh, as a vibrant marketplace. So, it's, in many ways, it's, it's a highly vibrant, exciting place to be to be operating right now. Uh, the challenge for traditional uh, um, uh, uh, financial brands 
and some are doing this better than others, um, you know, are, are to communicate um, the, 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 uh, a, a more innovative front, to, to be able to uh, trans transfer the trust that they have built up in their brands over decades into more um, adaptable, relevant uh, services and experiences um for for um for, for their customers i mean I, i'll give you an example it's not in their survey but in the index but you know um coots the uh the, the you know high net worth bank um in the uk but also obviously a global brand has has really begun to evolve its you know its traditional positioning um you know as the queen's banker as it was called into a much more eclectic interesting uh offer a much more varied proposition and really showcasing the people who use it it's not necessarily the people who you would readily assume so i think again it partly goes back to what we're talking about about healthcare companies wanting to be you know to come out from behind their their um the, 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 their exteriors their logos and actually begin to tell more compelling stories and show that show more of themselves and and, and also i guess it, you know it's the same old cliche about you know continually innovate drive personalization these people have a lot of data on us. Of course, it's a regulated industry, but the ability to, you know, to use what they know with smart data analytics to, to provide, you know, invaluable services because financial service brands are critical to our lives. It's just that people are more open these days to using uh, brands like TransferWise, Revolut, to do some of the things that they previously would have relied on their banks. So it's, I'd say it's a highly fertile, you know, innovative space and the, the the brands that are you know really well placed to take advantage of that are actually the most trusted ones. It's just we've, we've caught them in this in in this in this in early in twenty twenty at that pivot moment when we're moving from the old world of banking into the new. And I certainly see some interesting things going on um, from some of the traditional banks right now. Okay, and then um, the last area that the index focuses on is industrials, telcos, and oil and gas. What, what's the story there? I think it's a question of of to what extent they are perceived to be making themselves fundamental to human life. Um, I think that uh, brands like Verizon have really got on on, 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 on leadership in, around 5G in the States. I think that's seen as a platform that will be fundamental to life in the future. I think if you look at the way that uh, Next Era Energy is, uh, is scoring really highly on our, our index because it's building the future of, um, of renewables or, sp or certainly perceived to be. Um, I think the jury's out for some of the traditional brands, a little bit like um, we just talked a minute ago. Um, um, uh, you know, but we know that companies like BP and Shell are looking at how do they pivot from you know, fossil fuel dependency into, into the new future. The other company I think is really interesting to talk about, and I did mention them earlier as, as, as you know, the highest, highest new entrants, if you like, to use a old top of the pops raise at number two, which is Reliance Industries. Um, you know, Reliance is a, obviously a, a huge conglomerate, but one of their real powerhouse brands is Geo, the, uh, the, the mobile phone uh, brand. And I think one of the many things that, that Geo is doing is, 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 is really providing uh, smartphones and, and mobile networks as a platform for education, for small business and commerce, uh, not just for communicating with your mates. And I, and I think that, again, it comes back to what extent these, 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 some of these older world brands, you know, that may be in the index or have been in and around our index, are able to make themselves relevant to the future as opposed to providers of you know telco or oil and gas in the past so it's it's a real pivot point in terms of you know new priorities uh you know getting yourselves ready for what's to come and mucking out how you can be relevant to people's lives in the future as opposed to provide them with what that you always have done in the past so when you think about the challenges across all these sectors 2020 was um certainly a year for for strong leadership the report highlights um that respondents wanted or, or at least claim to want um a brand spearheaded by someone who puts people ahead of profits and isn't afraid to prioritize integrity over shareholder profits so i'm keen to hear what you both think makes a great ceo but um you've got a minute to uh, to think about that because here's what paul bolt uh, thought well a great a great ceo I, I think sets and lives um the values and the culture of a business there's a ton of qualities that, of course, they, they need to be great communicators, to be adaptable, to possess incredible powers of strategic intent that can energize the company. There's a number in there that of qualities in there that most people would would chalk up as a great CEO. But I think today, more so than ever, I would add authenticity, 
a humility and empathy to the, the those the, those qualities of a great CEO. And I think the business leaders today and the business leaders of the future will be displaying humility and empathy and authenticity alongside what are maybe some of the more traditional characteristics we think of. I see this a lot actually in interviews when I interview people applying for roles at Microsoft. They want to come to Microsoft because they want to help change the world. They believe Microsoft can provide them with a platform to to make that level of difference. But they also always refer to the high integrity of Satya Nadella. They they think Satya has incredibly high integrity. Uh, so not only are they here to to think that as a as an organisation we stand for a better future than the one we've already built, but they consistently call out the integrity of Satya Nadella. And, and this is the first time in my career where the vast majority of the interviews I have on behalf of that organisation, the CEO and the CEO's integrity is held up as a as, as a reason for wanting to be here. So I think there's a very powerful set of very human skills required now to augment some of the more traditional CEO skill sets that we, we've discussed. Uh, Stephen, um, thoughts on what makes a great CEO? I think that the whole role there is continuously evolving. Uh, I think that these days, more than ever, uh, CEOs are expected to have an absolute clarity of purpose both as far as their own role is concerned, but also as far as their company is concerned. Um, And to the point at the beginning, I I, I do truly think that they need to retain an unerring focus on anticipating and reacting to customers' needs, while at the same time truly looking out for their staff. It's going to sound a bit stupid, uh, but I think that to achieve that... um, they need to deeply understand the business that it is that they're in. Not just about the business the way it is today, but also where it is that the business is coming from. You know, I I think that the heritage of a company has a bigger part to play than perhaps some people might imagine. You know, and in addition to understanding the company today and the company's heritage, I think that they also truly need to understand who they're serving and why those customers are choosing to buy those products. As I said at the beginning, it might sound a bit stupid, like it might sound a bit obvious, but if you don't know those things as a CEO, then you don't have a foundation on which to build. Because I think that great CEOs need to show an ability to capitalize on strengths and abilities that already exist in their organizations. And to turn those strengths and abilities into avenues that are going to better serve the customers that that they're already serving, which will in turn have the effect of opening the door to new customers to step in. And in addition to those two pieces of the pieces of the quadrant, you know, they also need to embrace their responsibilities, and it is absolute responsibilities to do the right things for the, the communities that they're serving. No matter whether one is actually talking about the the local community, in our case, that a restaurant could be in, or even a global community. And I think that these days for a a CEO in a large organization, it's where I said earlier, like uh, the role continues to grow every day. Because on top of all of those things that uh, we're expecting CEOs to do, this bit about being able to communicate all of that in an authentic way, It takes a lot to make a great CEO, I think is the summary. Um, It's not impossible, but at the same time, like uh, we expect a lot. Uh, John? Well, I think Paul's right. I mean, people like Satya Nadella are pretty unique. Um, And, 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 you know, he's an example of a great CEO. Um, But for every Satya Nadella, every, um, you know, every Elon Musk, I think there's a different way of doing things a little bit. I think not everyone can be like those people. I think they can, they're, they're relatively unique. What I kind of sense the way the world is going now is a much more inclusive world, a more, you know, less about the cult of individuals, less presidential, um, more maybe first or at least semi-first amongst equals. And I think that the world is too complicated, um, too diverse to, to, to be, led by individuals Um, I think individual companies need to be led by by really diverse teams and therefore I think the role of a CEO is to figure out the right team 
um, and, and it doesn't always have to be down to the responsibility of one person. And 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 you know the the the, the figuring out the right team needs and you know requires a global sensibility. It means a real confidence around how we address difference and how we don't see um, how, how we move past making everyone. You know, we, we, you know, we, there's a real tendency to level organizations and now oh, I don't see difference. We're all equal. Well, actually, we're, we're all different. And I think finding ways of creating really diverse teams where everyone is coexisting, but not codependent. I think the dependency on an individual is a risky way to go because you're only as good as that individual. And then what comes next? Whereas I think what we're doing and the great organizations are passing on values and behaviors and legacies um that, that that will will outlive any one individual so i think the role of a ceo in many ways is to to, to get back among the pack and to to build out a really powerful team that that's really bred on difference and, and really brings difference into the boardroom because so i think that's the only way we're gonna genuinely cope with the uncertainty and unexpectedness that will come and and, and also find ways of you know i think i think companies will become more individual as i talked about at the start if there's more voices and difference at the boardroom table as opposed to relying on the cult of individuals um a little bit having said all of that of course there are some truly iconic individuals who can do all that in one person and i think obviously <laughs> such an adele is a great example of that <laughs> so i kind of there's two ways to go you can either be iconic and brilliant or if you if you're a, if you're a mere mortal like the rest of us build a great team <laughs> <laughs> well you, you touched on on sort of like the future a little bit there so let, let's move on to that i mean and i know it's a difficult task in this current environment but from putting this index um together john what do you see the biggest threats to business um the most important biggest unbelievable get your head around it quickly it's coming back it got delayed by covid is genuine leadership around sustainability and when I say sustainability, everyone who's listening to this, this podcast has instantly started thinking about climate and environment and maybe a little bit of inclusion. What I think is going to happen as we go into 2021 and move forward is a whole new reinterpretation of what it takes to be a truly sustainable company. Um, I think people at customers expect us to be doing certain things, expect us to behave in certain ways. I think the truly s sustainable companies of tomorrow will be exceeding expectation itself. It won't be enough to just be good on climate, to just be good on um, equity and inclusion. Sustainable businesses of the future will do far more than just the triple bottom line of people, profit and, 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 and um, planet. They'll be thinking about how do they drive trust? How do they make people feel that what they make and do and serve is indispensable? How do they innovate and thought lead their category? How do they um, provide a platform for talent to express itself, for people to um, experiments and genuinely be open and, and try new things and push the world forward. All of these things will will really you know change what it means to be a sustainable business. And from an investor perspective, I think the whole um, ESG agenda will will massively broaden to take all of what I just said into account. And at the moment, when I look across the piece, when I look across the index, you know, obviously there are some companies that are well placed to do that. You know, Apple, Amazon. Microsoft, on you know McDonald's, um, you know, but none of the none of the companies right now are are really front and centre on everything. They've all got uh, work to do. Um, we we talked a little bit just now about AstraZeneca and Pfizer, these companies that have punched into the consciousness around COVID. But how do those companies provide pleasure in people's lives? How do they you know demonstrate the quality of their people? How do they continue to thought lead when there isn't a pandemic? How do they tell consistent stories and bring their personality to, to the way that they operate in the world? All of these things are unknown right now. And I think they're gonna be real challenges for CEOs or teams of, of leaders to really um, figure out because that is the key to becoming sustainable, a genuinely sustainable business in the future. I think that's the only real agenda that businesses should be worrying about right now. Are you working with any of your clients in the lead up to COP26 on this? Like using that as a as a moment in time to push their sustainability messages. yeah i mean we're, we're we um you know like a lot of companies have been um work well a, a lot of companies right now are looking at what they stand for their purpose their positioning how they do what they do where they attract talent from and what they want to stand for in the future um and there are obviously co companies i can't necessarily name out but no businesses in the healthcare sector uh predominantly are realizing their potential and realizing how much more they need to do 
Uh, the tech sector, tech sector is looking at how does it evolve. You know, Paul was talking very much earlier on about where these companies came from in terms of whether it's e-commerce or social connection or just getting bumping into old friends. Their whole role in in the world is is evolving hugely, but and there are big gaps in their perception that they can fill with what they're capable of doing. So yeah, there are a lot of moves going on right now by organizations who are looking at broadening out what it is that they stand for beyond just what they're known for today. And, and that is, you know, really the key to becoming truly sustainable and, and leading on that agenda, as opposed to being sort of uh, something that's passed over to the sort of corp, corp comms team or the PR team to try and defend the business. It's a, it's a really interesting battleground, which I think will provide real opportunity for competitive advantage. Stephen? Uh, I would agree wholeheartedly with what John was saying there. Um, you know, on, on his piece about uh, expressing purpose and mission, etc. like uh, during the last part of 2020, uh, our CEO very publicly, you know, like uh, gave visibility to what our purpose is as a company, um, what our mission is, like uh, identifying the values that it is that uh, we've got at the core of the business these days, uh, and also identifying the, the pillars that we're looking at to grow the business. You know, and if anyone wants to see what that looks like, they just need to go onto YouTube and Google Worldwide Connection and uh, they'll see it all. Uh, they'll see it all there. Um, I, I think beyond that, you know, at, at a very like business level, I, I think and thinking about threats to businesses and individual organizations, I, I think you can see a few like um, you know, one, one could be denial, like and when I say denial, it is anyone who expects things to go back to where they were pre-pandemic is in for a big shock. Like, uh, they won't. Because people have found ways to do things that they need to using approaches that they never did before and which they now prefer. So some things won't change. Anyone who believes otherwise, like, is, is in denial. I think, you know, for many organizations as well, the pandemic presented an opportunity to a number of organizations to take you know, a good, long, hard look at themselves, uh, truly understand themselves from the inside out. Uh, and I think that big organizations that haven't done that and haven't done a bit of navel gazing you know, might not understand like, uh, where it is that they stand today and therefore what it is that they truly need to address when things start to get back towards something that's a bit different different uh, from where it is today and maybe a little bit closer to where it was in the past. Um, the other piece that I, I said, and it comes back to this piece in terms of blurring lines in organization, organizations that still haven't got to grip with the integration of digital technology into their business like, uh, are going to be finding themselves increasingly left in the sidelines. Um, and I would say that the further one that I had in mind was a piece as far as agility. It's probably the last one I, men I would mention, uh, which is, you know, we do speak of, people do speak of new normals or have spoken about the next normals. I think that the coming few years, we could see some relatively volatile fluctuations in the way customers behave. Um, you know, the pandemic is still with us, and quite frankly, that's fueling tensions in financial, social, and political arenas that still need to be played out. You know, so I think that the final mantra that we'd have is to uh, the the question is concerned would be be ready to be surprised um, because it wouldn't be a bad one to keep in mind. Um, here's Paul Bolt on this as well. It's a very difficult difficult question to answer. When I think about where we are today one of the few comparable scenarios that we can look back on are some of the kind of more recent deep recessions. Uh, and, and, and there are some key learnings to be had when you look at how businesses are performed under the, these circumstances. Now, I'm not suggesting that COVID and a recession is one and the same, but clearly there's some economic similarity. I think there's some fundamental questions you need to ask yourself as a business. Does what you did before set you up for success moving forward? Is your mission and purpose still relevant? Do you have um, the skills and the tools needed to to accelerate as the new world forms? Because you know some organisations will do this well, 
um, they will take market share, they will be successful. Other organizations will fail, frankly, and then new organizations will emerge at pace and create and take market share. So for me, I mean, in summary, the, the biggest threats are skills and skill shortages in your business, static business models that you're struggling to reimagine, um, but ultimately, you know, antiquated technology, antiquated tools and platforms um, to to allow your business to thrive. Hey, we're uh, we're coming to the end of the podcast. Um, it's been a long one again. <laughs> Not surprising with with John on on it. Um, oh. but <laughs> I've got I've got used to it now with with you as a guest. You have to edit. edit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, l- l- listen. I want to get one last thought from you both on what um, those CMO CEOs and, and you know others involved in their business uh, purposes listening to this podcast need to be focusing on to get things right in their organisation. Um, and you never know, perhaps um, you know even appear higher up in in the uh, in the next release of the index when it comes out shortly. Um, but uh, before I come to you two, uh, here's Paul Bolt on this. I mean, I would say, you know, be deliberate uh, in the work that you do and also make sure that you're driving clarity in your organisation because, you know, I mean, clarity in the sense that people understand your mission. Because one thing that's clear when you look through this report is that purpose-driven organisations continue to perform very well uh, on this index. So I think there's a, a, a couple of questions to ask. Uh, And I would start with, does your mission galvanize and inspire people, employees, customers? You know, does it do that? One of the best questions I've heard asked on this topic to, unfortunately for them in a live session, I won't won't name the business, uh, was if you no longer existed, would you be missed? And what would the impact be? And I think, you know, using that as a cut through question to determine whether your organization understands what it does, why it does it, and who it does it for. You really need to you know, ensure that those components are in place. You can answer those questions. And then, of course, you need to think about how do you track, measure, and actively plan um, around that mission, around that clarity. You know, I've worked in organizations in my life where we've had very little budget, and we would use anything from customer net promoter scores to determine the experiences our customers are having with us. Um, and I've seen that go right through to quite sophisticated use of third-party insights to understand the perception of, of, of your brand. But I think you need to be deliberate. You need to drive real clarity as to the mission and purpose of your organization. Uh, and then I would say the one piece of advice is, you know, build your comms and marketing strategy to reflect what makes you special and what differentiates you. As I, as I said in the earlier answer, sometimes it's easy in the midst of it all to forget that people really want to understand what you what you stand for. So be deliberate, have clarity, think about how you're going to measure it, and ultimately make sure you're communicating to the world what makes you special and what makes you different. Stephen, your thoughts on this? Yeah, for me, it's about identifying and solidifying those attributes of a company that show it absolutely lives its responsibilities. And to amplify those attributes that can elevate its individuality, not just in its own sector, but beyond. Uh, John? I think it's all about diversity. I think it's about different, bringing different people into your business. Um, finding uh, that there's, there's, there's so much talent that doesn't get a voice, um, even within companies now. Um, there's also people who never get the chance to work for companies. And I think that the more different you can bring into your business, um, not only is it morally responsible, but it's also will lead to unexpected, exciting outcomes because they're not coming from the same old voices, the same old groupthink. And I think the world is desperately wanting a little bit of difference when we come out of of, of what's gone before. Um, And then, you know, individual companies that, companies that want to you know become more individual to stand out to um you know create the platforms on which life will will, will exist in the future will have to embrace the difference that exists in the world right now I, at the moment i still think it's something people tend to talk about but it isn't necessarily being manifest in real behaviors but i think that's number one priority to unlocking a lot of what we've talked about today john we've we've talked about the fact that um 
you're working on the next release of the Future Brand Index. Just very quickly, you know, given the year that we have had, what, what are you expecting from that report? I, I've learned over the years never to anticipate, no, never to expect things in, in in research when you ask human beings because they they're so they're so damn inconsistent in what they think. But no, I, th I think we'll probably be seeing uh, more. Uh, you know, what I wouldn't be surprised to see is 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 more of a reflection of the changing priorities in people's lives, what they and and slightly more polarized responses to brands. I think everything's under the scrut scrutiny. I think 2020 really elevated our fears for our future. It elevated our fears for the planet, our own mental health, our own financial health. I think people are, you know, feeling a little bit raw. And I think that they will highly reward companies that are seen to be making positive steps, even if they're fallible, even if they are, you know, not getting it 100% right. And they'll be pretty unforgiving on organizations that still are hiding in the pack. John, if, um, if listeners want to download a, a copy of the 2020 Future Brand Index, but obviously register their interest uh, for the next edition, um, or indeed find out you know, any further information, where's the best place for them to go? On our website, uh, if you go to www.futurebrand.com and you hit the Thought Leadership tab at the top, it takes you to all our Thought Leadership, which includes obviously the FBI, the Future Brand Index, our country uh, brand report also, and other um, thought leadership is all on that one page. Well, that wraps up this episode. So thanks once again to Stephen and John for joining me online today. And of course, to Paul Bolt for his contributions too. If you'd like to get in touch with Future Brand about their Future Brand Index, um, you can do that using the email hello at futurebrand.com. In the meantime, we hope you've enjoyed this episode and we'd love to hear any comments you may have on our discussion. So if you'd like to contribute, uh, you can do that on our Facebook page, Twitter feed, our YouTube channel, LinkedIn and Instagram pages as well they are all linked from the top of the website at csweetpodcast.com uh, where you'll also find all our previous shows and supporting show notes plus links to where you can subscribe for automatic downloads of each episode via your favorite podcast app and if you've enjoyed the podcast please do give us a positive rating and review uh, don't forget we've got competitions on the website too where we regularly give away newly released uh, business books so please do check those out uh, there's a link on the top nav bar to our latest one uh, finally if you'd like to get in touch with the show you can do that via the contact form on the website uh, or you can connect with me on Twitter using at Ross Goldsmith or you can find me on LinkedIn. But for now, thanks for listening and goodbye. <laughs>